Professor Carey, what a pleasure to have this opportunity to ask you uh, a few questions and give you an opportunity to revisit some of your former, uh, former work. Uh, um, the, the article on, uh, on McLuhan and Innes is, is really interesting. Uh, you, uh, you, you wrote that in 1964. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to take us back to 1964 and give us a sense of the uh, situation that you were in when you wrote that article. What were your own personal interests? Uh, what were your personal experiences? And uh, um, help us to flesh out the circumstance in which uh, you wrote that, both intellectual and personal. Uh, a few years before, in the summer of 1960, uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois, and Marshall McLuhan showed up one day with a, a mimeograph manuscript under his arm entitled Understanding Media, a book that didn't see the light of day until four years later. It was then a report for the United States Office of Education on the reform of education in the United States, designed to get to, to move teachers away from a purely print and literate culture to an engagement with what was then called the new media. I was doing a degree, but I did not at the time want to be an academic. I wanted to be a freelance writer and was working on the problem that uh, if you're a freelance writer, you sell your work by the word. A dollar a word on a good day, a nickel a word on a bad day, but they're priced as commodities on the market. You get the same thing for any word. T-H-E gets you a dollar, and supercalifragilistic expialidocious gets you a dollar. <laughs> they are simply priced in a market, in an international market. In fact. I was trying to understand how the market and words worked. And the only person I knew of who had spent, paid any attention to this was this relatively obscure Canadian economist, Harold Innes, who had incidentally hired Marshall McLuhan at the University of Toronto when McLuhan returned from it. So out of that, a kind of connection grew, both between an engagement between McLuhan and myself, him much the senior, my much the junior, uh, that revolved around our common interest in Innes and the work on the technology of communication, which he said he was following out. But having been trained in literary criticism, he followed it out in a radically different direction, <laughs> that is within a context of communication as literature, not communication as, as, as words in the context of economic markets. The piece is in a way a reflection on my trying to deal with these two people, but it's written at a particular historical moment, namely in 1964 we had the first teachings on the Vietnam War, and the civil rights activity was the major political game on the campuses of the United States. So it was also written in the context of an engagement with practical politics and how these two figures stood relative to them. And your own um, intellectual life at that time uh, had been focused from a content perspective on, uh, on the history of communications on the relationship of communications to politics and, and social structure? Yes, but in a, in, a, in a particular way. My academic training had been in economics. Ah. And therefore, I was an economist who wanted to be a popular writer. Ah. So I was thrown into the task of figuring out how the market for writing worked and how it was changed by the telegraph, by the mass press, by the emergence of big city dailies and national and international magazines. So it was only content in that indirect way. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was an approach to content that looked at the economic underpinnings of, uh, of, of the content. Uh, and therefore, the engagement with McLuhan was an engagement with a different set of problems, in a way. Uh, despite what he said later about the medium is the message, because he came to it from the standpoint of art and literature, it inevitably had to be a more uh, engagement with the content itself. Uh, I get the sense from, uh, from your article that um, 
you probably would then, given your interest in economics, much more naturally attracted to Innes, who tries to relate shifts in communications technologies to changes in social structure, which are always much more tongue and groove yes. with, uh, uh, with economic structures. And, uh, and uh, from your article, get the sense that uh, you had something of a struggle with the more prophetic, less analytic uh, mind of McLuhan. I'd be interested in hearing anything you'd like to say about uh, the way that these two very large figures uh, played themselves out in what was a younger man's mind at that time. Well, uh, it was an engagement of that kind, but it was mediated by my own political interests, which went very back into the... Tr I came from a family of trade union organizers. Uh, uh, so it was, it was an engagement with politics in a more direct and immediate way. Uh, in that regard, I found Innes a much more attractive figure. He was further to the left. He was closer to the trade union movement. He was an economic nationalist. In, in, in representing Canada's interest relative to the United States. He was an opponent of the Cold War. That is, there were a series of issues that engaged him that also engaged me at that time. Uh, McLuhan, on the one hand, was prophetic, but we remember McLuhan wrote a book published, I suppose it would have been 67 or 68, called War and Peace in the Global Village, in which there's one sentence about Vietnam. That, of course, is the issue that's on everyone's mind at the time. So that while McLuhan engaged very large questions of culture and cultural change, if you read through it and say, what did he say in 64 or, 60 or 66 about Vietnam or the civil rights movement, on those questions he was silent. He just did not engage matters at that level. So in some sense, yes, I, I was less drawn to the great prophecies about where the whole world was going and more drawn to what were we going to do tomorrow about this and that, and how from a study of economics and communications and technology could one better equip oneself to deal with the more immediate problems. I admired McLuhan very much in part because A, he was a wonderful conversationalist, and it was just a pleasure to be in his company, uh, and uh, secondly, he had some body of relatively, yes, unsystematic <laughs> ideas. He had a terrific capacity to observe things, uh, to make very precise and interesting observations about things. So he kind of engaged my imagination in, in quite a different way and answered another, to another set of needs. He says at the beginning of the Gutenberg Galaxy, you can consider my work a footnote to Harold Innes. So I said, well, if it's a footnote to Harold Ennis, I prefer the main body of the text and not the footnote. I thought at that point at least it was a more useful body of work in pursuing both the kinds of intellectual problem um, I wanted to pursue, uh, but also the, the issues that were on the practical agenda of politics. I don't have to tell you that uh, you can be a young faculty member uh, in the 1960s without having views on the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War and to be teaching in these areas. No one was going to listen to you very long. You might be able to do it if you were uh, an elevated professor off teaching advanced graduate students only. But if you're in the undergraduate classroom, you had to deal, find a way of dealing with these issues. The, uh, when you compare uh, uh, McLuhan and Innes, just, just yes. picking up on your conversation. Um, it's almost as if uh, Innes is represented as a much more analytical, rooted in political reality and social reality. And uh, McLuhan, uh, uh, a, a, a kind of secular religion uh, emanating out of a kind of techno-determinism. But when you read the works of both men, mm -hmm. the thing that seems to be shared is that uh, both styles are opaque. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and uh, in many instances, um, requiring um, enormous leaps by the reader uh, yes. to fill in the blanks that sometimes seem to exist, even between sentences. Um, 
And um, I was wondering, given the difference that you see between the two men, why is it that Innes would choose such a style and uh, if, if, in fact, his intention was so much more along the traditional lines of a, of a social or political theorist? The, let, let me answer just a bit more the difference between them substantively and then the stylistic difference by, by using, in a way, a kind of an example. Um, if, um, if I said to you today that uh, there are two problems that are on my mind. <laughs> Uh, there's a problem of globalization, the development of global markets in culture, technology, terror, disease, whatever it is. You're. And you wanted to understand the history of globalization and the way globalization has been driven, not only by the Industrial Revolution, but by the changes in communication that accompany it, from high-speed navigation to the telegraph uh, to the internet. Uh, on the, if, if that was your problem, you would do much better reading Innes. Innes's work was, much of it was situated on the first phase of globalization that goes from the telegraph to the underwater cable to the development of empires, right. particularly the British Empire, of which Canada was a part and did not get dislodged at all until 1867. Uh, so, Innes was most acute on doing that. So if he said, I'd like to move forward to try to understand what was the difference between globalization phase one, let us say, and glo which ends in World War I, and globalization phase two, which ends at the World Trade Center on September 11th. Innes would be much better at helping you with that. But suppose you started from a different sense and said, why is it that, that I think one way and my children think a different way? Why did I grow up in a literary culture and they don't live in that same literary culture at all? This is not to say it is, it is not an intelligent culture. It's just to say the text, the cultural objects with which they are engaged and the way they're engaged with them is altogether different from the cultural objects with which mine engage. I mean, to put it simply and obviously, I'm much more engaged with religion than they are, and religious texts, much less engaged with music. I'm much more engaged with literature, particularly fiction. They are much more engaged with television and film. In other words, what McLuhan realized as he started to teach was that he was teaching the canon of English literature to undergraduates at the University of Wisconsin who could read Shakespeare or read Johnson, who's up above us, but that was not their culture. <laughs> their culture, in the real sense, not in the artificial sense of a didactic culture acquired in school, but a lived culture, a body of lived experience, was in their engagement with television, subsequently, but originally, motion pictures, radio, mass magazines, the mass press. Now, if you take that forward and say, what is it like to live in, in the midst of a cultural formation, um, a cultural formation like, the, uh, like cable television and the World Wide Web, I once defined cable television as a system in which on one channel, Channel 9, there is oral Roberts, and on the next channel, there is oral sex. That is to say, <laughs> it produces an entirely different configuration of cultural forms and an entirely new set of juxtapositions within them. The same person who turns on the internet to pursue the latest news in international relations then turns it on to a pornographic site. And all of a sudden, things which historically had been bed, embedded in different repositories, institutional repository, physical repository, are now put in the same space. They're next to one another, rubbing up one another, and rubbing up against individuals who inhabit that common space. That's a McLuhan problem. 
about which Innes has much less to say. And because both, in a way, are parts of globalization, but they treat two different aspects of the matter of globalization. That's the content. The style is this. You're a Canadian. It's the late 1940s. You're opposed to the Cold War. You want to prevent Canada from being dragged into the Cold War by its big next door neighbor. You visit the Soviet Union after World War II. You come away with all sorts of problems with it, but some interest in it as an experiment. You're the leading intellectual figure at the time in Canada. This is the era, every place of McCarthy. You can't speak clearly very well about these things. Much of Innes's obscurity ah. comes from burying the political message <laughs> within a structure of of prose that will, will retain his position in Canada and let him get said what he said. So he typically says his most aggressive radical things by, by quoting other people, much more respectable figures who can get away with it. The obscurity is political. McLuhan's is political in a certain sense, too. Just give her the examples I've used. McLuhan's a conservative Catholic. He's converted by reading G.K. Chesterton. He's a daily communicant the rest of his life. His biographer says, though his children are less sure about this, he prevented them from watching television by insisting they say the rosary after dinner. Now, here's a person who becomes a kind of champion of, of the new Haight-Ashbury culture of Los Angeles, right? And who, at the same time, is profoundly conservative <laughs> politically as well as culturally. This is another ambiguous position, so that McLuhan deliberately, in a way, withheld many of his deepest <laughs> feelings. He rarely talked about his position on abortion, <laughs> or birth control, <laughs> or all sorts of other subjects because that would also present the problem of the conflict between a public persona and a system of, of private beliefs. Now, there's one other thing. Both of them talked their books better than they wrote them. <laughs> McLuhan was a wonderful conversationalist, not a very good writer. He was impatient with the writing. Many of the books were dictated, patched together. <laughs> the staff worked on them. That is, he never really produced, well, maybe with one exception, a coherent body of prose analysis of the problem. Mm. They were left more in insightful observations. Mm. My sense from what you've said uh, is that uh, Innes had reasons for the obscurity and complexity of his style that had to do with uh, providing a context for someone who understood the codes and could in a sense, uh, reap the implications of his commentary. Um, uh, McLuhan, on the other hand, it's more puzzling to me because the fact of the matter is, and you even mentioned in your article that uh, you mentioned him in conjunction with Norman O. Brown. Yeah. And living through those years, I know that McLuhan and Norman O. Brown and Alan Watts with the politics of experience, there was almost an underground curriculum that developed right. around these people. We read all these books while we were reading Cicero's De Oratore in, yes, in yes. the classroom. We were reading all these books. And it was a justification for all kinds of behavior. Uh, it constituted an ideology for the, our generation. Yes. Um, that I would think that McLuhan would really want to separate himself from. So I, I really wonder about whether or not that ever troubled him, that he became a, uh, an icon and a means of justification for a world of behavior uh, about which he had real reservation given his commitments as a conservative Catholic. Yeah. Well, in, in some sense, that's, that's a question we, no one's been able to answer very well. He remains enigmatic enough, I think, to, to, to prevent him from doing it. There are two explanations, however, for that, and they, they may be too easy. Uh, McLuhan, in some ways, was the first celebrity intellectual of our culture. 
He publishes Understanding Media in 1964. In 1965, Tom Wolfe writes a, an article in Harper's, What If He's Right, <laughs> which <laughs> propels him onto a kind of national stage. Uh, he is then, there's a couple of people out in San Francisco, principally an advertising man, Howard Gossage, who is a kind of scout for interesting intellectual figures. Gossage becomes his manager, in a way. Gossage organizes sessions in New York where McLuhan would be brought in to speak to people. That is, he became an enormously profitable, <laughs> if brief, enterprise <laughs> for all sorts of people. One night we were sharing a room up in a little town in Ontario, and he's going on you understand, I was, maybe I was an associate professor then, probably getting $50 for any guest lecture I did. And Marshall's going, oh, God, I got to go to Hawaii and talk to IBM for 20000 Then I come back to San Francisco and I give a <laughs> lecture to AT&T for 15000 He goes on complaining for hours about oh, how much sure. money he's making, right. how much celebrity he has, how it's ruining his life, how he's not. He's not doing all the things he wants to do, but in some sense, clearly enjoying it to some degree. And I, th I thought in the more tragic moments is an example of what success does to Americans. Bud Schilberg wrote a wonderful book a number of years ago called The Four Seasons of Success. And it was about famous American writers, Scott Fitzgerald Hemingway, who became successes. They all ended up bad <laughs> in some way. And it was on the problem of what happens when you get caught up, in McLuhan's case, in the very machinery that you're, uh, you're advertising. So that's one. That's a kind of tragic explanation of, of why he allowed himself into the machinery, the cultural machinery uh, of, uh, of the time. The other thing is, is that you can take him as a kind of forerunner of a new kind of writing and a new kind of speaking that hadn't been seen before. It was a genre we had not yet encountered. <laughs> uh, it's, it later became celebrated in an essay of uh, Clifford Geertz as blue genres, where all of a sudden the old distinctions of print literacy between fact and fiction, <laughs> science and the humanities, critical commentary and performance art, poetry and propaganda, all of these differences started to go away. And books started to appear that were unclassifiable. What was Norman O. Brown? Was this a literary critic? Was this a psychoanalytic theorist? What do you do with books like this? And when they came upon the scene in the 1960s, no one knew what uh, Library of Congress call number to put on them, where to shelve them in the library, what discipline they fell, uh, they fell under. And so part of the cultural eruption of the time was also the eruption of new forms of writing that were often difficult, in part because they were so new, that you had no mental system in which to classify them. I think on the other side of him, I was taught, perhaps as you were, that, that when you got up on the lecture platform and you talked to an intellectual, you were serious. Right? You, this was not a game. You were not playful. But McLuhan, of course, adopted an entirely new style. So uh, someone would raise an objection to what he would say, and his answer would be, you don't like, you don't like that fallacy of mine? I've got another fallacy for you. You don't like that idea? I've got three or four more you won't like. <laughs> that is, every response was never serious. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 from the outside, it looked dismissive, and it would often take the form of, oh, God, you're a creature of the old print literacy. Get with it. <laughs> Figure out what is going on. But there was a dead seriousness in the sense that he thought he was, in a way, the James Joyce of his time. He was doing to intellectual discourse what Joyce did to the novel, inventing a new form and a new form of, of, of presentation. So there was, there was a real seriousness. And then the final thing to note is that 
he would often, of course, say, give you some brief insight to how dark his vision was. So when he introduced or reintroduced the phrase uh, global village into it, it inevitably became transmitted as this kind of happy new world uh, where the lambs and the lions, east and the west, north and south, would li lie down together. You know, we would become neighbors and friends in the global village. And then he would say, the global village is going to be an angry and violent place. <laughs> we haven't seen anything. So he knew, he knew the dark side of his own thought and would give it away in an illusion or a throwaway. But the central body of the argument was the more prophetic, if you will, positive, optimistic, one that appealed to the new culture of liberation of the 1960. I'm interested in, um, in your article where um, uh, you're, you're taking up the, the sense of a homogenization of culture that occurs as a result of the globalization of the technology and a, yeah. a kind of convergence of icons and a, a winning out of difference. And yes. then the assertion that the new domain of difference is generational difference and that generational difference moves apace with technological innovation, if I, if yes. I have your, your, yep. your appreciation correct. Yes. The, um, I was wondering, would you revisit that again um, in the context of the, 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 the kind of discourse we're encountering now, I guess yeah. embl uh, emblematic of it, I guess, is Ben Barber and his concept of jihad versus Macworld, where he, he sees the juxtaposition of, in a sense, the same global reality linked to multinational corporations and driven by the technology. but. Uh, the diversity and difference in all these primordial fundamentalist entities that survive either as uh, sacralized ethnicities or, uh, or groups that are devoted to some single metaphysical principle that they're willing to kill for and so on. Uh, yeah. Do you feel like there's uh, something you didn't anticipate or... Um, no, there was something I got wrong. Something you got wrong? <laughs> yeah, I, got, I mean, I, well, I got it half right. I think I got it half right. Or a quarter right. I, can't, I don't know what the proportions were. I mean, I, I was saying, I think, what many people said at the time. Due to uh, uh, global transportation and communication, the world was becoming homogenized. Human differences were not being eliminated, but they were, relatively speaking, being leveled out. And so the sharp kinds of differences between cultural practices that generations of anthropologists had analyzed when they presented you with a tribe that not only seemed to live in another place, but live in a, a different planet. They thought thoughts. They engaged in actions. Uh, they perform certain practices that were so foreign, so alien in every way, that one didn't know quite how to wrap one's mind around. Is those extremes of differences were being leveled out. That was the first part of the argument. The second part of it was, is that I was trying to suggest, is that difference doesn't disappear. And as you said, it shifts into another dimension, time. At the same time, there are sharper generational divides. I mean, partly we can tell it through historical writing. It's only in the 20th century that we really write histories of decades. So now we've got the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Each decade's got its book. Each decade's taken to be very different from the decade that preceded decade after. It's the first time that I know that people really started to describe themselves in generational terms, however crudely. Uh, and so that, uh, that now every 10 years we get a new generation, and the generations war with one another a bit. You know, oh, the new generation, they weren't as good as we were back in the 60s. We were really. That is, that there's a kind of generation keeping uh, that has gone on. And in some ways, I think aspects of that are still uh, true. But I didn't anticipate, it seems to be two things. 
One was what uh, Freud called the narcissism of small differences. Uh, that is to say, because people become more alike, doesn't mean be, they become more friendly with one another. Sometimes when the difference between people shrink, the remaining differences, small, <laughs> become fault lines of real antagonism at the same time. And so I saw this as too continuous <laughs> a, 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 a spectrum that was moving together. And the other thing that, that seems to be that you know, we're much more aware of now is that I was thinking of a world in which uh, the Afghanis are over there and the Americans are over here. And um, because they're using telephones and driving automobiles, you know, and uh, showing up in suits and ties occasionally, that we were, were drawing uh, together that way. But I wasn't thinking of Afghanis living in the next block, <laughs> one floor above me in the apartment house, <laughs> having their own program on the cable channel. In other words, difference, differences weren't being effaced, they were being relocated. They used to be over there, now they're here. <laughs> they used to be on the other side of the world, now they're in the next block. <laughs> For at that time, understand, the range of differences one was encountering on a daily basis, we will call it the European range, <laughs> spiced with some Asians, and of course African cultures, thoroughly Americanized by that, their own way. But that was in an earlier phase when all of a sudden the whole world seemed to go in motion and people started showing up next door to you who were people you long before that had to take a very long voyage in space and time to connect with. So that in part my own revision of it is to, is to recognize a level of complexity in it, which I failed to do then, in part because I failed to anticipate the real history that we were going through, and, and partly because uh, I was trying to be too simple with this space and time distinction and not seeing the remaining problems, political, social, cultural, uh, that it was going to present uh, when these kinds of, of uh, relocations actually uh, uh, took place. So, I mean, I still like aspects of the analysis. I just wish I was more sophisticated then <laughs> about how to get my hands around it. So. Is it possible that um, uh, in prior context, before the effulgence of multinational corporations, that homogenization was really part of the, um, the agenda of uh, creating mass markets. Um, and um, uh, in a way that uh, was tightly joined with a kind of social control and that with the emergence of the multinational corporation, uh, it isn't that important, really, what political persuasion or primordial commitments you have, provided that you um, are, in fact, a part of that, that, in a sense, shell of culture that uh, acts as the gateway to the product universe that those corporations depend on. I'm thinking about, for instance, the the, uh, the image that Ben Barber refers to where um, it was in Afghanistan, but it was in the prior war where um, one man had hung another, but they were both wearing the same sneakers. Mm -hmm. Or in a fast bender film where uh, there's a sniper up on the roof, uh, except that he's got, uh, he's got, uh, um, He's got the headphones on and he's listening to some very current American piece of music while he's picking people off in the street, yeah. which yeah. seemed to be expressive of a different kind of di uh, a different kind of dis um, uh, a different attitude towards uh, how the economy interacts with political and social structures and and forms of social and cultural control. Uh, I mean that's. The, uh, well, I have to say it's a very large question, I, and I'll, I'll start on taking parts of it, and we can go on from there.
Uh, first of all, um, the, the, the equivalents of sneakers and headphones <laughs> have been circulating around the world longer than we can remember. I mean, it's easy for us now to think, again, that there was always uh, an East here and a West there, and never the twain shall meet. But in fact, long before there were multinational corporations, there were diffusions of languages, of cultural practices, of styles of art, mm -hmm. of modes of dress mm -hmm. throughout the world by their own. And the example I would, I would think that we would, uh, would uh, meditate on is this. Uh, the Western system of musical notation was invented in the 16th century in Italy. Within a hundred years, Western music had been set to writing, had taken on its written form, and the Western system of notation diffused throughout the world. It did not require elaborate systems of musical corporations to translate every music in the world into the system the Italian monks invented for recording Gregorian chant so it would be easy for young boys uh, to sing. Uh, and if you wanted to look at a kind of imperial expansion, I'm sure even today if we went to Kabul we'd find Brahms, Beethoven. That is, we, we don't quite think of this like Nike sneakers. Mm -hmm. right? And even if we took traditional Afghan music, mm -hmm. we would find it scored in the Western notational system. But to the degree it's no longer identified with monks up in the Italian hills trying to write down the Gregorian chant. I think it's worth understanding or remembering how much diffusion went on sure. before there was a Nike corporation and what an old social process this is. So part of what we're talking about is, yes, not only the expansion of the multinational corporation, but of the expansion of the brand name and the systems of copyright ownership and control which go with it, which are relatively speaking a product partly of the 19th century, but much more so of our own uh, time. Because the forms of economic expansion that, that go on today are not the forms of economic expansion that went on in the 19th century, just a simple example. When we think of the 19th century economic expansion, we think of, uh, of uh, Britain importing tobacco, cotton, all the raw materials it needed, uh, right, and then selling, uh, selling the product back to the natives. You know, we were the natives too for a long, long period of time, and they're, uh, they're selling it back. The difference is now is that you walk into a store and there are competing brands which come from every country. So now is it a situation in which the Americans made the cars and they sold it to people who didn't know how to make the cars. Now on an American street there are cars competitively made competing against one another from all over the world. So that the structure of market and economic relations um, has changed so over these two periods of time that it's, it's difficult to track it now, to go to some of that image. So we do now have pastiche cultures, but they're not only on the rooftops of Afghanistan. I suppose if we went through my use of things in a day, it may, not, it may look perfectly normal that I should be wearing um, Italian shoes. <laughs> Uh, Chinese jackets, right? Uh, playing, uh, uh, playing music that was manufactured uh, in Taiwan. We don't notice these things until we read closely the ownership logos that are at the bottom of them. But even a culture such as this one, which looks to be somehow Western, American-made, has signatures that come from all over the world on it. And that has only changed more so in recent years. There are other aspects of that question I know I didn't get to, but. That's <laughs> perfectly reasonable. This is, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the, uh, the end of the 
Ennis McLuhan article, uh, yeah. which I, which I <laughs> felt were really, I felt the, the passages were moving and poetic and I was wondering if I could ask you to revisit it again and, <laughs> and comment on it. Yeah, I, uh, um, uh, first of all, just uh, an impression that there's obviously a, not obviously, but there seems to be a real love-hate relationship that you have with McLuhan's work. And, uh, and it comes out in places where, for instance, you call him a poet of technology. Yeah. And it begins uh, really uh, in a way that uh, seems laudatory, where he represents a secular prayer to technology, a magical incantation designed to quell one's fears and, and so on. And I think it leads in the direction of arguing that uh, there's a, a kind of determinism in his work that... Uh, really seems to imply a very benign uh, final cause or end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, but uh, there doesn't seem to be any room for human will or choice or any sense of uh, human agency as an important factor. And you seem to take a very strong existential position um, in the end of the article, uh, really not being comfortable ultimately with him almost implying, and this may be completely wrong, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about it, that he may not care that much about what he's saying and mm -hmm. really lived his own life and made his own choices, not in the context of his conceptualizations, but using some other set of parameters as a meaningful set of terms to face his life. Yeah. I, I realize that's a complicated statement and question, but I'd be curious yeah. about how you feel uh, now, looking back about what you said and what you were feeling and thinking when you wrote that, uh, what you might say now? Well, when I, when I, when in fact I wrote the piece originally, uh, I didn't write that last section. I, I left it off, and, and maybe it was because um, with someone with whom uh, you have, I mean, the distant, Friendship. Uh, I mean, I suppose Marsha, when I met him, was 50 years old, and I was 25 or something. He seemed very old to me <laughs> at the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, very senior. You know, yeah. who who was I, right. Right. kind of, to be doing this? Uh, and and because, as I've indicated, I enjoyed my contact with him and and valued it in that sense. But as the decade of the 60s wore on. I became increasingly uncomfortable with it and for, for a couple of, of reasons. And, and here I'm going to have to separate out what Marshall said from what he meant, or, or his private self from his public self, uh, and be a bit agnostic on what did he really believe. But I had come increasingly to the conclusion that, um, as many other people have written, is that technology plays a very special role in American life. I don't mean you won't find examples of it other places. I simply mean that because we are a country that was created in the age of technology, we are a product of modern technology. We were created by the development of long distance navigation, the technological capacity of Europe to jump the Atlantic boundaries and reestablish itself. We could never have kept this country together without the railroad and the telegraph. We gave enormous leeway to the expansion of, of technology in American life, saw it in a benign light. It was positive. It was the principal instrument of progress. I recognize that. At the same time, I don't particularly agree with it all the time. Technological change involves loss. Things go away. You lose things. And I'm enough of a pragmatist to believe there's something bitter always in the bottom of the cup. <laughs> you know, for everything you get, you lose something. And it's a complicated bargain saying, um, let's extend the speed and distance of communication. Now, of course, if everyone's sitting around in my apartment building wired into the internet to such a degree that no one talks to one another anymore, there's a real loss of neighborliness. 
of next door friendship, of mutual help and regard, of knowledge of one another that in certain moments can be vitally crucial to the operation of the social system. But in general, when technology is analyzed as a phenomenon, the losses and the exposures or weaknesses or vulnerabilities that a country is exposed to or a people is exposed to tend to be uh, lost. We certainly learned that in the 1960s. We dropped all the tonnage of weaponry on Vietnam, we could. As best we could tell, we couldn't stop them at all. We couldn't even slow them down. We couldn't interdict their supply lines. Nothing we did. And yet we did not need September 11 to find out we're really vulnerable <laughs> to bombs and explosions. In this city, you blow up the Holland Tunnel, uh, the George Washington Bridge and all, just a few installations, this place stops. We'll drown in our own garbage. We will not be able to meet the most elementary functions of life. The strength of Vietnam was in some sense, as a, as a people, as a country we were fighting with, its non-technological strengths. It was terrific at innovating around every problem. It was terrific at marshalling resources in small amounts and deploying them in creative ways. So we said, I know how we can do it. Why don't we export American technology there? We'll put the Tennessee Valley Authority in, but we'll call it um, the Mekong Delta Authority. We'll, we'll light the country, you may forget this, we'll light the country electrically. We'll call it the Rural Electrification Commission of Southeast Asia. We would put an electric barrier across the DMZ to prevent infiltration. In other words, we took what are really great technological institutions of the United States, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, and said, if we implant them there, the people will say, this is terrific, this is wonderful, we want this too, and suddenly throw up their hands. Now I go too far, I get carried away, but you can hear, you can hear the 1960s, I mean you can hear the passion of the 1960s in my voice as one's trying to judge foreign policy. McLuhan never commented on these things, but all I'm trying to say, a particular way in which he looked at technology, in the main, as benign, as being an instrument of social progress and development, that each phase of this development led to things that were better than what was before, that the losses were not so great, seemed to me fed into a very problematic American myth. And it was a myth, it, it was a myth that engaged us often in social projects, military projects. There were not commitments that could be sustained on that basis alone. And so my more tragic, pragmatic, leftist at the time, more leftist than now, but whatever that set of commitments were that are also mine, increasingly as that difficult decade went on, I felt more estranged from these ways of talking uh, about things. And to find these ways of talking about things, even though they were not on the surface political, to be views that had political implications, and not altogether happy ones. But there's something else. There's something else I detect uh, in yeah. your commentary that I I think is more deeply personal. Uh -huh. That it almost seems as if you your experience of the McLuhan argument uh, is demonstrative of a kind of disrespect for the the singular struggle of each human being hang on, even the quotes that you deploy in the end of the article yeah. uh, mm -hmm. where um, you talk about being born troubled <laughs> <laughs> and only surviving by the grace of God. Um, and uh, I've forgotten, was it Eugene O'Neill? Yes, it's a wonderful um, 
line of Eugene, uh, 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 men are born broken, they live by mending, the grace of God is glue. Right, yeah. right. But that's, that's a tragic sense of life. And, and I happen to believe that, that all human experience teaches us that. I mean, that's what it seems to, to, to me to teach. I mean, there's a way, there's a, I hesitate on the edge of a more personal way of answering it, but I'll fall off the end anyway. Uh, I mean, there are two kind of Catholics. There are, there are Good Friday Catholics, and you know, and there are Easter Sunday Catholics. I'm a Good Friday Catholic. <laughs> I'm not an Easter Sunday. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's the God of defeat who appeals to me, not the God of triumph. Because uh, that's, that's closer to the human condition. That we encounter things in life, always. Problems in ourselves, problems in the world that don't yield to us. That we can't solve. That are not subject to quick fixes for which you just don't win by, by spending another million dollars building another machines. These have a more rooted existence. And, and, it, and it seemed to me at that period of time, that which it seems to me is, in fact, a lesson you can find at all organized religions. It's just that McLuhan and myself transacted it across this bridge of Catholicism, but you can find it. You know, I mean, we can, you know, we can, uh, we can go on to Job, you know, shaking his fist at God. Why do you do this to me? Uh, I mean, that's, that seems, that for me is the most vital cultural tradition we have, most important one, most useful one, all of those things. And, and one knows the temptation, at least, I think, one knows the temptation very strongly to want to say to people, things are going to be better tomorrow. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> You know, yeah. we'll take care of this. Yeah, yeah you know, that's, you know, um, raise the budget uh, a little more. <laughs> we'll do all right, you know. You know, give us more money and all the students become geniuses and all the faculty become nice, you know. <laughs> all our problems go away. We won't fight with one another anymore. And there'll no be no conflicts and faculty meetings and there won't be like a consignment to hell, you know. Uh, but that's, that doesn't happen. You know, we can have uh, the best machinery in the world. And those conflicts, which are rooted, forgive the phrase, I must, in human nature and human cussedness and the limitation of human intelligence, of moral will and value, are just remain deeply there. And I'm suspicious of, obviously, what you, what you leap upon in the last part of that article. When that side of McLuhan became part of a public persona, which drew which drew people to him, which became an ideology in its own right. Maybe not a narrowly political ideology, but in the structure of that time, an ideology. This, uh, this is not good. This is not uh, helpful to us. And so I ended up saying, I've got to write something about this at the end. I've got to state my opposition, not merely in technical terms, <laughs> by doing sorts of analysis, but in um, moral and evaluative terms as well. And so that's what I tried to do. I'm glad you did. It, it <laughs> sounded like many of the discussions we were having in, in uh, apartments up and down the west side in the late 60s, uh, when all of these things were part of the, 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 uh, the informal education I think we all got. Um, I'd like to ask you, um, do you feel that the technological innovations of the 38 years, if you'll allow me to mention how many years uh, mm -hmm. there are in between the publication of this article and now, mm -hmm. have actually, uh, in a sense, uh, decreased the capacity of, uh, of universities and schools as, uh, as educators to bring to life the, the tradition that is essentially the humanistic tradition that tries to propagate uh, that sense of the challenge of existence and the challenge of the meaning-making enterprise in the face of the tragic circumstance that really emanates from our nature and, and the constraints within which we live. 
are we in even worse shape now because of the more aggressive forms of mediation and uh, for some cultural pollution that have occurred as mm -hmm. a result of the uh, advance and intensification of these technologies? Well, uh, the humanistic tradition has weakened, but uh, I suppose my temptation is to say in a special sense of what that humanistic tradition is because it's been one under constant <laughs> revision and change over the course of time. And I want to be careful not to get too romantic about, uh, about that. But if, this puts it too broadly. For me, the differences between the sciences and the humanities is that uh, you read a scientific book once. If you've understood it, you put it down and you go on to the next scientific book. If you read a humanistic book once and you think you understand it, you don't understand it. You read it twice, or three times, or four times. That is that the humanities are a slow process of depth reading in which each time you encounter the text, the text becomes richer. The interpretive possibilities become more extensive. Within the printed tradition, of course, we always had this division. It was partly religious, too. You had people who read the same books time and time again, of which, of course, the Bible was the best example. You didn't read it once, you know, and grasp the thing. You had to go back to it day after day. But there were many books in, in an old Protestant tradition. You read Pilgrim's Progress every year as well. In other words, there were few texts consulted Frequently. In the middle of the 19th century, we got to the bestseller phase, and right, in which every day there was a new book to be read, and the old books to be set aside. There was a difference between the way writing literature generally lodged itself in life. Now, at least all I say is it's part, I mean, it's interesting to talk about it in this light because for all I've said about McLuhan, I've gone back and read those books a half a dozen times or more. And I read in his twice as much. Because I think that they are books that don't yield easily. You know, they're not puzzles to be figured out. You know, they're, um, they're, they're more like deep tanks of water <laughs> to immerse yourself in time and time again. Now, I think that, it, I mean, this is going to put it too crudely, but it's all the only metaphor I get. We're a culture of the bestseller list. You know, uh, uh, what he Hegel said that the modern world was born when people got up in the morning and read the newspapers rather than saying their prayers. Now, I don't get up and read the newspaper in the morning or say my prayers either. I read my email. That's where I start the day. Every day brings new email, new messages. Now, they may be, in fact, the same old message. They usually are. <laughs> you know, I don't have startling learning experiences from the latest inundation that has piled up overnight. But what I'm trying to say is that this notion all right, of attending yourself to the newest, the latest, <laughs> The next piece of information, what's happened now, that sense, which is only loosely scientific. I'm just trying to uh, draw this, not uh, confuse it, but is a sense of, 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 of believing that understanding advances each unit or moment of time. Each new experiment advances your knowledge over the old experiment. Each new piece of information brings you more than you had before. That sense of it, which is both, I'm going off a bit on a tangent here, uh, which is an experience in commerce and politics as well as in the university. Victorians complain wonderfully. There's a, once a telegraph came in, you know, business never stopped. They used to think you could go home at the end of the day, be with your family, have a meal, read a book, but then the telegraph came. The price of grain has changed in Bulgaria. We have to trade now. It gave birth 
to a 24-7, 365 a day a year. And being wired into a system that lives that way is not a good system, I think, for the humanities, where I, the best books never stop giving. And it, but it's very hard for us to go back and read books once we've read them, think we understand them, have them in our past, not in our future. So I think that makes the humanities more difficult now, or they're a more fragile place. And it may lead to an excessive emphasis, even in the humanities, on the new, the original, the most recently discovered, mm -hmm. as if um, the latest fashion in literary criticism is better than what people were reading in the 1890s, which may not be true at all, of course. Your characterization of, of reading and engagement with the humanities and yeah. going back to a text uh, uh, was interesting. The, the, the sense that the, the text or whatever the object is has a certain depth and that each time you attend to it, it'll reveal new facets and new dimensions of itself. Yes. And I assume that you also meant that uh, as one does that, one is in fact engaging new dimensions of yourself yes. so that there's a, an enrichment and expansion of your own inner world as you in fact uh, um, uh, create an extension of meaning uh, for yourself within the text environment. I, I set that out that way because I'm interested in asking whether or not you, you think there's any reality to what some postmodern social theorists will call uh, a waning of affect, almost uh, mm -hmm. a sense that if that inner universe um, was one that came of age within a certain technological setting, that it's possible that we actually will in some way lose that sense of depth, mm -hmm. that we will become uh, more uh, uh, beings that understand ourselves within the reciprocity and relationships of, of stimulus once again, uh, yeah. as we did in the, in the uh, almost the pre-Platonic period. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a difficult question uh, to, to answer for the following reason. Uh, it implies a kind of linearity to that, to this, you know, that we used to be this and now we're that, and mm -hmm. that will be something else. That makes me uncomfortable. I, uh, let me start at the other end, uh, and it goes back to an earlier question here. Uh, in principle, I can believe, though it makes me very uncomfortable, uh, that Samuel Huntington's in right is that religion's going to come back. Um, that generations in the future are going to go back to reading the Koran um, and the Bible and the Talmud and the sacred text. You know, that the next phase of civilization could be different, but bear some striking similarities in both good and bad senses to things in the past. So that what I'm trying to say is that if we begin from the notion the waning of affect, I think that there are strict limitations on how much affect can wane because people can't live without affect, without charging their lives with emotional, affective meaning of seeing deep significance of things. Now, if the established roots of culture, however, if we're talking in terms of literature or a system of reading, root that out, people will find it other ways. They will recreate it. They'll find the tools either by recreating old talents in new ways uh, or using new technological forms <laughs> in ways they're unintended. <laughs> to serve novel uh, groups of uh, novel purposes to which they were not intended. I mean, formally, this is to say there's a kind of dialectical tension between these impulses. Uh, and that's in part why a certain kind of progressive imagination, 
you know, that see certain changes coming about, or I suppose even a kind of regressive imagination that just sees the world going to hell in some continuous line too, are uh, both likely to, um, uh, to be wrong. This example may get me off the point, but uh, the one I've used often is that in um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's autobiography, The Oak and the Calf, tells a wonderful little story about it. Uh, if I remember the details correctly, he was in his 20s when he was arrested on the Austrian front at the end of World War II. He had written a number of letters that were largely critical of Russian literature of the, of the communist era, but also certain Russian policies. And he was imprisoned and sent into the gulag. And he tells us in the oak and the calf, uh, he says, I knew all my life I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't, know, didn't have a subject. And I suddenly found a subject when they put me in the gulag. The subject was me. What was happening to me? I had to record this. He says, how am I going to do this? How am I going to record it without any instruments to write? And he reinvented the oral tradition, as he tells us. Every day, he, he transformed his experience into verse as he worked and spent the nights memorizing the verse. And he says when he comes out, the Gulag Archipelago is a recording of his memory. Now, there's an extraordinary reinvention of all traditions that you're familiar with of the oral tradition of encasing experience in prose, embedding the prose in heads, so it's available and above all is not accessible to political authorities. Because as he tells us in that introduction, he says, uh, and in a number of his poems, which are quite moving on this, he says, uh, they could do everything to me, but they could not get the poetry out of my head. It was the only part of my being that was inaccessible <laughs> to them. So that, that's the sense. I mean, people have a need to record their experience, to find significance in it, to celebrate it, and to share it, to build up strengths and resources to deal with things. If the established kind of roots of culture, which for any set of reasons, they could be technological, they could be institutional, um, you know, uh, render, the world, render a world without affect, without the kind of emotional charge, people will reinvent it. The danger always is, is that they'll reinvent it in a way that will be destructive. I mean, the, the secret is. One, one can't, it seems to me, argue in many ways with the kind of religious fundamentalisms in the world. I mean, one, one may wish they were in a different form or more mild. We understand that these are responses to the very difficult circumstances people find themselves in now, the pressures from a real world that are bearing on them. And intelligence would say, the, the, response, the need is real. Now how can it be organized in such a way that it's not destructive? It doesn't destroy the very world it would like to protect and enhance.